Tenakato, Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Kato. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. There's a lot of you. It's a real pleasure and it's an honour to be here speaking at this inaugural lecture. And I'd like to thank the Vice Chancellor for his very kind words. I'd forgotten I did all those things. Um, <laughs> Before I actually launch into the science tonight, I'm, I would like to just give a, a brief introduction to, to me. You've heard a few things, but um, many of you will know and many of you will detect that I wasn't actually born in New Zealand. I uh, was born in England. My parents emigrated when I was 11, ostensibly because my father wanted to grow cabbages. I guess cabbages don't grow in Britain, but there we go. Um, and, and once I reached New Zealand, from the outset, I became deeply enamoured of the outdoors in New Zealand. And, and outdoor activities, outdoor pursuits have formed a very important part of my life here. At the same time as enjoying the outdoors, I've also, right from an early age, are we working? No, the technology's not working. Oh, it helps if we turn it on, doesn't it? I am a paleontologist, please forgive me. Um, from an early stage, I was one of those kids who was fascinated by natural, natural history objects, uh, skulls, bones, shells, fossils, minerals, and the whole lot. I was, I was, absolutely from fixated on these things from an early stage. And, and so I guess my, my love of the outdoors, in combination with my large love of natural history, naturally leads pretty much to one area as far as I can tell, and that's paleontology. Paleontology for me embodies the best of biology and zoology, which I love, but also the outdoors things and, and the understanding of landforms and landscapes and geology and so on. And it all comes together in, in paleontology. And it's been a fantastic career, I have to say. And it's taken me to many very interesting places. As the Vice Chancellor mentioned, I, I did my undergrad at Otago University, and then I went to Cambridge to do my PhD. <coughs> Cambridge is a stunningly lovely place. It was a, it was a fantastic experience. Um, much to my delight, I discovered that the, the residents of the native English residents of England had rather low expectations of their formerly colonial subjects, so it made my life much more relaxed than it might have been. I, I, I had a fabulous time there. Um, although Cambridge has some fantastic architecture and places to live, I managed to find one place that looked like and was commonly mistaken for a squat. Um, this is one of the many bicycles that had taken root outside our house, actually. My early career, my work in Cambridge and my early career was centred around fossil clams, things called dinoceramids, that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. Um, they were enormous, some of them, probably the biggest clams that have ever lived, up to maybe two metres long. This, is showing, this photo shows a New Zealand one, Megatoceramus rangatira, one of the largest. Um, spectacular beasts, I still have a very deep affection for them. I, I don't do a lot of work on them at the moment, there's all the unfinished projects in the bottom drawer of course. Um, just for the record, that one, that, that that large block showing on your right, um, you can see part of one of these things exposed there, it's partially covered. That block, for reference, weighs 3.2 tonnes. That block was actually recovered, it was in the middle of the Uruwera Ranges. That block has been recovered, there's an incredible story there actually, it's a story for another day. But anyway, I still have a deep love of these, these Cretaceous bivalves, one day I'll get back to them. Before I launch into the science, I really just want to uh, correct one misapprehension that seems to be out there. Some of you will have heard of the fossil group of fashion companies. Um, it's a large company. Their first quarter turnover this year, their first quarter earnings this year was two, uh, sorry, $600 million. They, they issued a press release in January that says, I'll read it to you, you can see it. Fossil is bringing fashion to the wearable world. It's time to stop thinking like a tech geek and start thinking like a fashionista. Well, I take exception to this. <laughs> As a professional paleontologist, I've embodied this ethos decades ago. <laughs> and so, in fact, on the, boulder, <laughs> on the boulder catwalk, I always look my best, even to the extent of having mud pack skin protection. <laughs> I've, um, I've, I've designed my own bespoke set of field hats, which offer unprecedented levels of safety and also make a bold fashion statement. <laughs> and I'm currently working on uh, some dynamic retro lizard skin field satchels, although it has to be said, these are a work in progress. <laughs> Enough of that. Let's talk some science. There's been a lot of discussion in the last few years about biodiversity, and actually it's discussion for, for all the wrong reasons. You'll see these headlines in the, in the mainstream media, in the popular press, in the scientific journals. 
all these ones, just, it's just a smattering of examples. These beg a whole bunch of questions, but first and foremost, they're talking about the sixth mass extinction. Presumably, that means there were five others. This is something we can think about. But this interest in biodiversity is centred on the fact that we might be losing biodiversity now. But this brings us to the fossil record. What were those other five mass extinctions and what can they tell us? Well, in fact, the, the paleontological record has played a huge role in influencing human, humankind's perception of their place in the universe, um, the, the role of life on this planet, the evolution of life on this planet. Um, I mean, arguably, Darwin's uh, theory of evolution was one of the seminal scientific steps taken by in, in science. And, and uh, defining humans' relationship and their understanding of their relationship to the universe. The fossil record provides a whole series of experiments, if you like, natural experiments on biodiversity change going back through the past. Um, we're, we're, some would argue, and I would agree with this, some would say that we're currently engaging in some sort of experiment. Well, the fossil record provides a whole load of other experiments that we can go back and look at. And, for example, experiments about these other five mass extinctions. Just for the record, one of those mass extinctions is shown in this photo. The, the recessed layer in the middle, there's a thin layer of clay in that. That clay records the instant that the dinosaurs went extinct when a 10 kilometer diameter asteroid slammed into Earth. Um, you can, and as geologists, you can easily recognize these, these mass extinction events in the, in the rock record, actually, because you find clusters of dead primitive life forms. In this case, a bunch of students, actually. Um, <laughs> Actually, for the record, no students were harmed in the taking of that photo. I, I have to say that with the health and safety laws as they are. So the fossil record tells us all about these things. So let's look. What, what does the fossil record say about biodiversity history? This diagram has been reproduced thousands and thousands of times uh, in various forms by various people. This is, this is just a particularly pleasing rendition of it. What does it show? If we accept this at face value, it shows, uh, and it goes from on, the, on your left, it shows, goes from 540 million years ago through to the present day on the right. And, and the y-axis represents biodiversity, in this case measured in terms of biological genera, and, and which is a good measure of biodiversity. And so what it shows, it shows that initial radiation of life called the Canberra Ordovician radiations. And then there's this thing called the Paleozoic Plateau that was followed by the biggest mass extinction in the Earth's history, called the, the Permian extinction, uh, which was in reality was much more abrupt than this, this diagram suggests. And then, then, since about 240 million years ago, there's been this long and accelerating increase in diversity, which, if we take this at face value, suggests that right now, the planet is hosting more species than it has ever hosted throughout the entire history of life. We can't take this at face value. There's many aspects of this that are very contentious, and, it's, and there's many aspects that have become really hot topics for discussion in the scientific literature and amongst paleontologists, and very, very, some very hot, opi um, strong opinions held. There's many aspects of this are wrong, but I became interested in this because I realised there's really fundamental questions about the history of life on this planet that actually we can't answer yet, which sort of seems amazing. So what are some of the questions that interest me? How many species can coexist on Earth? We don't know. Is there a fixed carrying capacity of species? And by that I mean, you know, in the absence of, of asteroids hitting Earth, could you just keep on slotting more and more species onto this planet in an ecosystem, just subdividing ecological space more and more finely? Or, or is there a, a, an actual limit to how many species you can cram in to this planet? And actually, a point I must make here, remember, as far as we know, this is the only planet with complex life. Maybe we'll discover other life. The chances are it'll be single-celled, microscopic. Maybe. Or, or maybe we won't. This is the only planet with complex life. Anyway, so is there a fixed carrying capacity of species? We don't know. If so, has this carrying capacity varied through time? Is the number of species controlled more, more by environmental effects, in other words, the asteroids hitting the planet or climate change or whatever, or by interactions between species, and by that I mean competition or predation. And, and, and people have got very hot under the collar about this. A lot of scientists tend to see things very black and white, all one or the other, and this, this debate has become very polarised. How has extinction varied over time, and why? 
and what attributes of species make them vulnerable to extinction? That's just a selection of questions I could go on. And, and obviously these are huge questions and they're complex questions and actually they're all intimately interrelated in, in, in complex ways as you'll sort of get an idea. We can't, I can't, certainly can't hope to answer all these and, and nobody in the world can at the moment. But we can poke them from different directions. We can try and poke these questions and, and, and try and get answers and look at them and try and uh, gain understandings of, of general patterns, general relationships. Just before I go any further, I want to acknowledge three people in particular. There will be other acknowledgements as I go, but these three people have um, collaborated with me on all the research you're going to hear about today. Uh, Roger Cooper at GNS Science, now retired but still very active, has been a fantastic mentor throughout my career. Both Michael Foote and Pete Sadler, Pete Sadler at the University of California and Michael Foote at the University of Ch Chicago, have been fantastic collaborators for more than 10 years, and, uh, and they continue to be. Just in passing, I find it curious that the natural pose for paleontologists seem to be what's known as the, hero, the, the superhero three-point stance. Um, I suspect that's just coincidence. Roger, you're here. Before I get on to I'm, I'm going to talk, just give four examples that sort of look at those questions I, I've posed. But before I do that, just one quick digression. The fossil record is far from perfect. In fact, Darwin agonized about this. He saw this as one of the major problems facing his um, theory of evolution. He couldn't see the intermediate stages. He thought all evo evolution happened gradually and therefore you should see intermediate stages between things and he didn't see those. And he explained that away as a, a, a function of the fact that the fossil record is so imperfect. And that quote is from him. He, he described this as a history of the world imperfectly kept and it's a, it's a long and eloquent paragraph that goes with that. But he, he worried a lot about this, and he's right. So at the trivial case, look at this example. The rocks go from old on the bottom to young at the top. There's no fossils at the bottom, lots of fossils in the middle, no fossils at the top. That doesn't mean that life evolved in the, middle of that pic in the lower quarter of that picture and then went extinct in the top quarter. It just means that there's an instant of time then when lots of fossils were preserved, and they weren't preserved outside that. This problem affects the fossil record from the scale of single outcrops to formations to countries to continents to the entire world. It's an imperfect thing. It's very patchy. To get fossilised uh, is, a, is a pretty chancy event. To illustrate why this is a problem, here's a, here's a lovely example. Live long, range far. We know that species with a small geographic range tend to leave few fossil occurrences. That's just... Uh, probability, if you like. They leave few fossil occurrences, and therefore we will always underestimate their true species duration in time. But at the same time, we also actually know that species with small geographic ranges do tend to have short durations, and therefore they will leave fewer occurrences. So there's two effects mixing in there, and it's very, very hard. What, one effect we're interested in, we're interested in that biological signal, the relationship between geographic range and the duration of species. We're, we're interested in that. The other thing, the sampling effect is actually a problem for us and we want to tease it out, but it's very hard to tease those two things apart. And that's the challenge we've got, to, tr to extract the true biological signals. This is where FRED comes in. FRED stands for the Fossil Record Electronic Database. And actually it was started by Harold Wellman of this university, who, who was a truly remarkable geologist. It started as a paper file. I show a couple of the original paper forms up there. Actually, those are in Harold Wellman's writing, or well, the top one is at least. Um, he started this in 1949. It's since been digitized, of course. It's now on a computer. But FRED is absolutely unique on the planet. It's essentially a complete documentation of the known fossil record of New Zealand. No other country has this, and, and other countries are gen very jealous. They're trying to emulate it. But it's too late for most countries. New Zealand got in just in time when we could actually do this. And the amazing thing about it is that obviously academic geologists contributed to it, but professional, um, all sorts of professional geologists, people at the Geological Survey, um, oil company, mining geologists, and, and a whole raft of amateurs. It's an essentially complete description. It's a, it's a fantastic tool, and it allows us to do things that other people cannot do. Um, it's even you know, take, uh, been noticed by the global community who, who've extolled the virtues of this, machine, of this uh, database, and also the fact that it's a collaborative venture between 
both the Geological Survey, or what is now GNS Science, and the Geoscience Society of New Zealand. So with databases like this, we can start to look at these problems of, say, bias in the fossil record and start to apply increasingly sophisticated techniques to tease apart the different effects. So let's get on to my actual science questions. Is there a fixed carrying capacity of species? OK, on this plot, time is going along to the right and diversity is going upwards. And I'm just going to illustrate some, some theoretical models. There's two basic classes of, of diversity theory, if you like. One is uh, equilibrium, that diversity is fixed, and the other one is the expansion, that e e uh, diversity is expanding. The fixed diversity one, basically you can model it by this uh, what's called a logistic equation. It's just a, a mathematical equation. But basically that predicts that from the start of diversity there should be a, a, an increase, an accelerating increase in diversity until you reach a point where competition starts to limit the amount of diversity you have. And then you, it plateaus, and you reach your fixed carrying capacity in terms of number of species. And at that point, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dynamic equilibrium, so that new species keep evolving, of course, but for every new species that evolves, on average, another one has to go extinct. So you, your total diversity stays the same. In contrast, oh, and I should say, here's an example of competition. This is uh, the Fariki Beach on the, in Golden Bay, and there's a bunch of worms and some little mussels in the middle desperately competing for space on that shore. And it looks like the worms are winning up. I don't know, one would need to go back and survey that. But that is intense competition for space. And, and so the logistic model suggests that competition limits diversity. The expansion model, well, you could have just an additive model where increasing diversity neither promotes nor, nor dampens um, ongoing increase in diversity. Or you could have the exponential model where as you, it's, there's a positive feedback, so as you get more species, that actually promotes the creation of still more species. And here you can think of something like the coral reef or, say, a tropical rainforest, where a single tree creates a vast amount of niches for other things to slot in, or in the case of the coral reef, where coral thickets create niches that weren't there before, so the increase in diversity creates a whole load more space for still more diversity. So if we go back to this diagram, you can see that... Um, there's a Paleozoic plateau. That might suggest the logistic model that, that uh, competition, limited diversity. But then there's the, since 240 million years ago, there's this, what looks like an exponential increase in diversity. Is that ever going to, ever going to tail off? We don't know. So the first example from New Zealand is the New Zealand mollusks. Um, we have a fantastic rec fossil record of, fossil, of mollusks from the last 50 million years. In fact, it's, it's better than all the rest of the Southern Hemisphere put together. I'd say it's 40% complete. We can do some fancy maths and work out using our FRED database that of all the species that existed, we've sampled 40% of them, which actually, to some people, may sound bad, but it's a stunning figure. It's a captive fauna. By that, I mean that New Zealand's been isolated from all the other continents for about 90 million years. And actually, whereas you think that snails might just drift between us and Australia, actually they don't. Unless you've got ships with ballast water coming and going, actually, by and large, the mollusks were captive on New Zealand. They didn't move around that much. And this, this database has had consistent treatment. By that, I mean there's only been a, a handful of experts working on them. And in fact, I must mention one in particular, Alan Bew, who is also now retired but still very active, and, and has single-handedly massively increased our knowledge of these fossil mollusks. With, with a consistent treatment. We don't have to worry about whether different people have called the same thing different names because it's been just a, a very few people doing that. This is just eye candy. This is just an example of a, of a seafloor from about 20 million years ago. And it just shows the richness, in places, the richness you can get of this, these fossil mollusks. So cut straight to a result. What we, when we published this, we said the ark was full. These three lines are three different analyses of that mollusk fossil record, record for about the last 40 million years. The three different analyses make very different assumptions about the problems in the fossil record. We've done them different ways, and they all come out with a remarkably consistent result. And they suggest that actually, in contrast to their international model that showed this sort of exponential increase in diversity, actually in New Zealand mollusks it doesn't look like that. It looks like diversity. Yes, it's wobbled around, but it looks like it's pretty much being capped. 
We can take this a bit further. These maps show the geographic evolution of New Zealand over the last 40 million years. The green areas are the, are the bits of continent that we still have left. The yellow areas are parts that have been uplifted and destroyed, washed away as uplifted as mountains and washed away and washed out to sea as sediment. The key point is, but between 25 and 20 million years, there was a major tectonic pulse. And between 16 and 10 million years, there was another major tectonic pulse. And these seem to be the times when biodiversity went down. So, so there's, there's unfinished business here, as I say. There's a lot we could still keep doing with this, and we would like to. Uh, we know that tectonics bias the fossil record. They, it affects the nature of the fossil record. But we also know that tectonics affects the environment and, and thus true diversity. And this is something we hope to work on. And in fact, I have a new PhD student who arrived yesterday from Britain, who might be here somewhere, who's going to be exploring some of this stuff with us. OK, example two. Extinction risk, survival of the has-beens. This is based on a data set of graptolites. Graptolites are a long extinct group, completely gone from the, the planet. They um, existed between about 500 and 400 million years ago. They were colonial floating animals that floated around in the sea up to a few centimetres long. The, the diagram on your right, you can see a one centimetre scale bar. Each one of those is graptolites. There's many different species on that slab, all different shapes. If you could take one of those off and, and look at it in life. It, it comprised a, a sort of um, a carapace, if you like, with a whole series of pockets in it, which a whole series of little colonial animals lived in. And these things fil floated around in the sea, filtering food out of the sea. They were a major part of the ecosystem at the time, of the oceanic e ecosystem. They were really a major component of that ecosystem. The diagram on the left is the diversity curve of those things, just arranged as what we call a spindle diagram, but number of species you can see on the bottom, and, and that shows how the diversity has changed through time. The different colours just represent the major groups within the graptolites. The point about that diagram illustrates this is, one of, is another of the most remarkable data sets in paleontology. I can claim absolutely no credit for it whatsoever. That was Roger Cooper and Pete Sadler over about 15 years have been building this data set. And in terms of its resolution, it follows the entire life history of a major group of organisms from start to finish. And in terms of its resolution, it is simply unprecedented. We can do some cool things with that. I'm the Johnny come lately in this work, but it's fantastic. So remember I said that if, if competition was controlling biodiversity, then you'd expect there to be some sort of carrying capacity. Well, a somewhat eccentric but very brilliant Chicago paleontologist called Lee Van Balen studied the fossil record. And he, he, um, he interpreted the fossil record to show that actually extinction at any time was equally likely, whether you'd been around for a long time as a species or whether we, you were a very newly evolved species, that the extinction was exactly, the extinction risk view was exactly the same. Um, you weren't protected if you'd been around a long time. You weren't protected from, from extinction. And you weren't protected if you, if you were newly evolved and had all the shiny new adaptations. And he interpreted this. He, he formulated a thing called the Red Queen hypothesis. There we go. Named after Alice in Wonderland that um, it takes all the running you can do to stay still. And basically, he interpreted this to mean that species are locked in a constant battle for survival. This one develops new spines, so this one develops better teeth. That one develops better spines, this one develops better teeth. And so this constant battle for survival. And they're always evolving. And so he interpreted this to mean that actually competition is the major control of, of, of biodiversity. Well, we look at the graptolites. Let's look at and see what the graptolites can tell us. This is a horrendous diagram, and I apologise, but I will walk you through it. On the bottom, you can see the time scale going from 480 million years ago to 420. Then on the top, that wiggly line is the extinction rate in the graptolites. And you see it's bouncing around like a, like a clown on steroids on a pogo stick, I guess. Um, and there's some big patterns in there. The bottom diagram, don't worry about what the y-axis shows. The coloured bands are the things that matters. Each, each point represents a cohort of species that existed at a particular time. So you have some of those are uh, 20 species, some of them are 60, 70 species that coexisted. So each point represents that cohort of species. The blue bar, if the points lie in the blue bar, it means those species 
the old species were most vulnerable to extinction compared to the young species. The middle pink bar indicates that actually the old species and the young species were equally vulnerable to extinction. And then the bottom, the bottom grey bar shows that young species were most vulnerable to extinction and the old species were resistant. Well, in fact, so what do you see? Contrary to what Van Valen suggested, in fact, you see most of the time the young species are most vulnerable to extinction. So, so one way of interpreting this is nature's throwing out species all the time, and actually most of them don't cut the mustard. The guys who've been around for a long time just knock them out. And that's completely contrary to what Van Valen suggested. But what we also see is that at the time of the big extinctions, that actually both long- and short-lived species were equally liable to go, extinction. That, uh, go extinct, and that does agree with Van Valen. And what you see is even in the, the, the biggest extinction, this thing called the end Ordovician mass extinction, it's one of the big five mass extinctions, in fact, it moved right into the area where the old species were most vulnerable. So this is a qualitative difference in the nature of these extinctions. But the point is, the most important thing, the most important message here is that most of the time, it's the young species that are going extinct. And this does not agree with the idea of competition, fixing species diversity. My third example. What do graptolites have in common with Jupiter? Well, you'd be quite justified in saying probably not a lot, but you'd be wrong. This is the driver. You've seen this. It's going from 480 million years ago on your left to 420 million years ago on your right. The, the extinction rate curve is the one you've just seen. The top curve is the rate of speciation, the origination rate. And again, it's bouncing around just like the extinction rate. Those bouncing around patterns are interesting. You can look at that and you think, wow, is there something regular going on there? And this sort of, um, it's called time series analysis, is actually surprisingly difficult to do. But it would be nice to, to, to have some way of looking at those and say, is there a regular frequency to the, that bouncing around? Well, in fact, we can do this. It's called spectral analysis. And again, this is quite a complicated diagram, but I can walk you through it. So that blue and red bar on the bottom is sitting against the same time scale. We lose the ends of it because spectral analysis sort of needs to get into the time series a certain distance before it can actually say anything. So you lose the ends. You lose the information at the ends. What we see on this diagram, the red areas tell us that the, the y-axis on that is frequency. So that's how many cycles per million years or how many ups and downs per million years. So a frequency of one tells you that the curve goes, wobbles up and down once per million years. A frequency of two, which is actually not on that diagram, but would just tell you that it wobbles up and down twice in a million years. The red bars indicate where there's lots of, lots of things going on at a particular frequency. So what we see is, uh, between about 470 and 455 million years, there's a lot going on at a frequency of about 0.7. That corresponds to a 1.3 million year pulse. In other words, extinction and origination are varying on 1.3 million years. Between about 455 and 430 million years, you can see there's a lot going on at a frequency of whatever that is, 0.3 or something like that. And that corresponds to a 2.6 million year pulse, much longer pulse. Now, this may all seem a bit esoteric, but actually, this is really exciting. This is how I look when I'm excited. This is an amazing result for, for two reasons. Firstly, th these things are what are known as Milankovitch grand cycles. Um, Milankovitch was a famous uh, physicist who, who came up with the theory of how Earth wobbles in its orbit. It has various wobbles that affect all aspects of well, climate and, and life on Earth. This is exciting because we know that these Milankovitch grand cycles probably went back this far, but nobody's ever been able to detect them before. Um, the astronomers can predict the Milankovitch cycles going back for, for 150 million years or something like that, but then chaos theory takes over and they can't predict what's happening before then. The other reason this is exciting is because nobody's ever documented before that these grand cycles actually affected biodiversity. Here we see origination rate and extinction rate being paced by these regular pulses. And, and these Milankovitch grand cycles are, to a fair degree, driven by the movement of Jupiter and Saturn and other solar system bodies. But the point is, that's how Jupiter affects the graptolites. So Jupiter is helping pace the evolution and extinction of graptolites. And, and by inference, 
all aspects of biodiversity. Obviously, that's happening through climate. Uh, Jupiter affects the orbit of Earth. Earth's wobbling in its orbit on these regular cycles. That affects climate, and that affected the graptolites. But here we have Jupiter. Let's simplify. Jupiter's driving biodiversity on Earth. <laughs> My very last example is I'm going to talk about these things, diatoms. These things, they, they're, be they're exquisitely beautiful things. These are single-celled algae. They make their, sh their, their skeletons out of glass. Um, and I guess part of their evolutionary success is probably down to the fact that they were simply incapable of throwing stones. They, they're so beautiful, it was actually in the, in the 19th century, it was a popular pastime, was to arrange them in slides like this as artworks. And apparently the best thing to arrange them was a, a tiger's whisker. I don't know where you get a tiger's whisker, but apparently you could. Anyway, and here this, this is building on the work of my former student, Rosie Cody who did some amazing work. Tragically, tragically, Rosie died two years ago. But, so we're, we're continuing this work now. And again, we hope to have another PhD stu student working in this area soon. Well, to cut right to the chase, what did Rosie find? So this is the um, rate of evolution and extinction in diatoms from the Southern Ocean. So this is the area south of New Zealand between New Zealand and the Antarctic over the last 15 million years. I'm sorry, the time axis on my graphs goes in different directions. It just different publications want it to go different ways, and it just propagates through into my talk, I'm afraid. So this goes from 15 million years on the right to zero million years, the present day on the left. What this shows is there's times when there was an awful lot of evolution and extinction going on, great big peaks, and there's time where, times where there was very little going on. And by looking at this, and, and the point is, over this, over this 15 million years period, there's been hundreds of major climatic cycles, glacial, interglacial cycles, um, major planetary coolings and warmings, coolings, warmings, they've, they've been going on particularly over the last few million years. But we only see a handful of these really big perturbations in the, the diatom evolution and extinction rates. And what it seems is, the ones we've marked, but some of the other ones as well, these correspond to times when there was a, the Antarctic went from a particular warmth to a particular cold. In other words, they were the big transitions. The two little maps show Antarctica, one with the, the top right one shows it with a small ice cap and small seasonal sea ice in blue. And the, the, the middle one shows the large ice cap and a large seasonal sea ice, a condition colder than, than today. And it's only when we saw these particularly big perturbations that the diatoms were affected. Um, there's several questions that remain un unanswered here. One of the things we're particularly concerned with now is, OK, so, so we know that the species are, are highly influenced by this. What does that... The diatoms form the base of the food chain in the Antarctic. Everything relies on diatoms. But what does it matter if the species change? Does that affect the ecosystem? Does that propagate up through the ecosystem and affect other things? We don't know. Also, we see these big changes at times of abrupt cooling. What happens at times of abrupt warming, warming as we are likely to see going forward from here? And so these are unanswered questions and things we hope to continue working on. So some quick conclusions, and, and then I've got a few wrap-up wrap up points. So from, from the four examples I've shown you, from New Zealand's rich, captive marine mollusks, it, seemed that, it seems that there is a limit to diversity. There is a limit to the number of species that can coexist. And this suggests that interactions between species may be an important control of biodiversity. But in contrast, for the graptolites, we actually find that more newly evolved species are more prone to extinction than the, the guys that have been around for a long time. And this, uh, with current thinking, this does not fit the expectation if interactions are the main control on biodiversity. So we, ha we have a conflict here. And for both graptolites and diatoms, there are thresholds. We see thresholds of environmental change, disturbance, beyond which the rules of normal species turnover break down that the normal rules break down and extinction and origination do their own thing. And this, of course, may be of relevance today. We don't know what we're doing to the ecosystems. So to wrap that all up in one line, it, if I was to go out on a limb and, and they say internationally, there's a lot of work being done on this, but I would say that limits on biodiversity result from the interplay of a fixed carrying capacity that varies through time in response to a changing environment. So I believe there is probably a carrying capacity I may be proven wrong. But I think that carrying capacity was varying in time, depending on environmental conditions. 
And, and I think we can also say with much more certainty that a significant fraction of the environmentally driven biodiversity change is actually caused ultimately by variations in Earth's orbit. So where to from here? It's actually an exciting time to be in paleontology. A lot of major developments happening. One of them is new technologies. Up till now, our, our study of the fossil record is pretty, pretty much limited to what you could scrape out, of, scrape out of a rock. And if the rock's really hard, that's a really hard thing to do. Perhaps you can use acid in some cases, but it's still a very hard and time-consuming thing to do. Well, we've got all these amazing imaging technologies coming on. I mean, CT scanners are synchrotrons, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of different scanners coming available that allow you to see inside the rock without breaking any rock at all. And you can extract, rather than just extracting the few good specimens that happen to come out, you can extract entire faunas from a, from a rock and study things that you just simply couldn't see anymore. This is my former PhD student, Kate, Katie Collins, who's now uh, doing a postdoc in Sh University of Chicago with what is arguably the most prestigious paleobiological group in the planet, with a guy called Dave Jablonski. And her project is actually um, scanning. She's going around the world scanning, 3D scanning, all sorts of fossil mollusks, in this case, to include in an absolutely grand study of evolution. This uh, brown and purple image is just one of her 3D scans that's been digitally taken apart, um, just to show the sort of thing you can do. This sort of technology, and getting back to what the Vice Chancellor said about the project with Naituhoi, this allows us to extract bones from rocks that would otherwise be very difficult. This rock you can see a five centimetre scale bar, it's a large rock, it's you know, something like this. And it contains the biggest mosasaur teeth that we've ever collected from New Zealand. Um, the mosasaurs were the large sort of crocodile-like marine reptiles that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. This is a big set of teeth. But the owner of the rock, understandably, it's such a beautiful rock, isn't it? Didn't want the rock destroyed to get the teeth out. And so, I say we, actually my colleague John Sines at GNS did this work, but scanned it, you can digitally extract it from the rock, make a 3D print of it, as I show there, and, and no need to break the rock open. And actually, you can do a much better job this way than you could by any mechanical or acid-based preparation. And so, the work with Nai Tuhoi, you know, we we'll hope maybe we'll get some of these things. Who knows? Unfortunately, our, our, we were meant to have started last summer. And, and so the rock formation that New Zealand's dinosaurs have all come from um, in Hawke's Bay extends right up through Te Orawera. And... and we're desperate to go and look, and it's a project led by Nai Tuhoi, but unfortunately the, the, the weather in the summer was so incredibly unkind, we eventually gave up, and so we're hoping to do it starting in December again this year. That's, that photo is from an earlier trip, and uh, I was the poor schmuck who ended up with the ring that was deflating the whole day. Um, but it's quite exciting, it's fun. So on about that note, I'll just finish with a comment on the fact that I'm... I'm joint position between GNS and Victoria University. And, of course, that comes with its challenges. It sometimes feels like you've got two organisations snapping at your heels. But actually, it's a fantastic synergy. Uh, it, each organisation comes with huge strengths and, and these amazing cultures to bring to it. And it feels like a complete win-win-win. And I think it's an exciting time to be a paleontologist, and I think there's a lot of really exciting work coming up. And I look forward to being involved in a bit of it with various new students. And thank you very much.